Do you remember when you were a kid? I don't know if it happened in your house where um, and, and the, your parents put you up against a wall and marked with a pencil how tall you were. And uh, next year they put you there again and marked you. And each year they marked you and you could see where your natural growth had grown. Well, that's, that's what that's sort of representing. Okay, and, um, and the thing with natural growth, you don't have to do anything. You just grow. You just eat and just live. Hey, uh, there's no effort in growing taller as a child in the natural. There's no effort in growing in the natural. But when it comes to growing in the spiritual, when it comes to growing academically and intellectually and spiritually, it takes effort. You don't just start growing you have to put in effort. And I want to share this morning the five stages of spiritual growth that God has determined for each one of us. And we're, we're, at, we're at different levels, okay? And just because you might be at babe level, it doesn't mean you're less important than the one who's up at an adult level. We're all love. We're all whānau, eh? In the whānau? In fact, the baby often gets the, most of the aroha, eh? Gets most of the love. That's so cute. But, so does uncle, and so does auntie, so does koro. And so in the whānau, everybody is loved, no matter what their age. And in the, in the whānau of God, we're all loved, no matter what our age. But there are different ages of spirituality. And <clears throat> you are at a, you'll be at a, a certain part in your journey with God. And I want to show you the five stages of spiritual development and growth and three keys to help you fast track to get there. <clears throat> Let me just um, have a chat to somebody next to you while I just get my notes sorted, please. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, could you put the first one up, please? First PowerPoint up, please. I hope that cross doesn't block it out too much. But um, so, yeah, so from the cradle to the grave, hey, you've seen these pictures. And I think without Jesus, why would you be born and why would you die? If there's no purpose to life, then just to go back into a hole. Like evolution teaches <clears throat> that we came from the monkeys, and we'll go to the whole. Well, don't believe that rubbish. It's it's humanism trying to make a monkey out of you. <laughs> yeah, they are. They're, they're crazy. They're fools. Says the fool in his heart has said there is no God. Anyway, so so. We're in a natural process of, de of growth, but you're also in a spiritual process of growth. Okay, next one, please. <clears throat> next PowerPoint, thank you. So some of the kings, when they were, they, they had a gift to rule over a nation. And, um, but some of them only stayed on their throne, a, one, some only stayed there a night or a couple of days or a month because their character, their maturity wasn't developed enough to keep them on their place of ruling, you see. Um, they still might have been 30 years of age, but they had 10-year-old attitudes. They had 9-year-old hissy fits. <laughs> and they were grown men, but they had never developed, matured in, their, uh, in, their, in, their, in themselves, in their character. So they had this great gift to papa. They were kings. They had this great gift, this great ability. But their character couldn't keep them where their gift took them. And we've got to be careful that we, we, we don't let our gifts take us where our character can't keep us. You understand that? Um, in heaven, God is impressed. He's not impressed with my gifts. He's not impressed with your gifts. You know, he's not impressed us with our gifts as a church. You know, we feed the poor. We, 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 we do lots of stuff in our community and uh, see miracles happening, healings, and all that sort of stuff. But God's not impressed with that. When I, when I pray for people and God does a miracle, He's not impressed with me because it's Him. <laughs> it's not me. But what He is impressed with is when I'm going through hell and I feel like giving up, but I choose, no, I'm going to just follow you, Jesus. That's what He's impressed with. He's impressed with our character. When we're going through crap, but we continue to hang on to Jesus and be like Jesus in the environment of hostility, that's what impresses God. He says, oh, look, there's my boy. There's my girl. She's growing up. That impresses God. Development of our character is what impresses heaven. Not the moving of our gifts, but the development of our character. 
because when we pass from this earth, it's how mature we are when we go to heaven. That sticks us with, with life. And so there's different levels of maturity in our lives. Could we put the next one up, please? And so even Jesus himself, you know, he went through a maturity development. So you have natural development, easy. You don't have to exercise anything. But if you want to grow and become all that God created you to be, who wants to be all that God created them to be? And you want to achieve all the things he destined you for in this world? Of course we do. Then, then it's going to require motivation, discipline, and effort. You know, Jesus didn't grow because the angels sprinkled fairy dust over him while he had a moi. Okay? He grew by studying the scriptures, by going to the hahi, by listening to other akomatuas teach him the ways of God. He learned. Next one, please. Next PowerPoint. Jesus learned by that. He, it says he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with man. In fact, over 30 years he was in, 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 the, uh, in the school of training. 30 years. Before he did any miracles, before he raised any dead people, before he opened any blind eyes, before he fed any thousands of people with, a, with some loaves and fishes, it was 30 years before he went into that mahi. Because it was a development of who he was. He had a grown wisdom and stature. Even at 12 years of age, you could see him down at the Jerusalem and the scriptures, and he was having a debate with the komatua of the day. And he's debating scripture. So it wasn't because the angels sprinkled fairy dust over him in the night. It was because he pushed himself to, to learn the scriptures, to understand the ways of God through Papa, Where he came from. And where he, why is he alive today? And where is he going after, this, after he's finished this, his, whaka, his mahi on the earth? And God wants us to be like that, to understand, to learn. Who are we? Who are we connected to? The great God. And what is his destiny for our lives? And it doesn't come by natural growth. It doesn't just come. It comes by studying the word. It comes by, by um, you know, uh, effort and, and having intention. And so I want to encourage you. I'm going to show you the five steps, the five stages of growth, and three keys to help you develop in that. Could we put the next one up, please? <clears throat> so the first stage is, <laughs> okay, let's read the scripture together. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So Jesus says in John 3, 3, unless a man is born again. So when you're born, you're what? You're born as a baby, right? You're not born as an adult. You're born as a baby. And so as a baby, there's a natural progression of natural development. And so when we're born again by the Spirit, we're our spiritual babes. The Bible says we're babes. Babes can't eat steak. They can't have pork bones and puha. <laughs> They've got to have milk. Okay? And it's, so when we first get, become to Christ, remember what it's like? We get a Bible. That's why we have foundations in the house. We, we just want to help new Christians uh, just understand who Jesus is and how to feed themselves from the Word of God. We don't tell them to read the book of Revelations. But just leave, read basic things about Jesus and about his values, about the principles. And it, so that's the sincere milk of the world. So some of you might be at that stage. I was at that stage one. I was a spiritual babe. But how many know that babies also make messes? And you've got to clean up after babies sometimes. And not that they mean to. They just don't have that social... They, don't just, they just don't care. They just Anywhere, anywhere, any place. Okay. And, and, and the, you learn to potty train them and so forth. But, you know, that's babes. You've got to be, show grace to new Christians. You've got to show grace and love and aroha. Okay, so, so the next one is, next uh, PowerPoint, please, is a toddler. So not a babe, but goes to the next level, which is a toddler. Let's read these scriptures. My little children, of whom I try out well in birth again until Christ is formed in you, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And so no longer a baby is able to eat the solids, and, um, and it's growing. Bones are getting stronger. It's learning to walk, and it falls over and skins its knee, cries. And that's what happened. As new Christians, often as a new Christian, I would start walking, trying, you know, trying to be a Christian. 
until I met Jesus, I said, oh, stop trying to be a Christian, just love me and follow me, and that makes it so much easier. It's about relationship, not about a lot of rules. But every now and again, I'd fall over, skin my knee. I would, uh, you know, <laughs> do things that I shouldn't do. And be like, oh, no, what have I done? I'm so, so feel so ashamed. That's okay. You fall over. You pick yourself up again, and that's why it's good to be in a house of aroha, where mom and papa and your brothers and sisters can just offer you and say, hey, it's okay. We're not perfect. We're getting their own process of growing up. And when you're surrounded by aroha and aroha and you love Jesus and you love others, yeah, you can grow in that environment. Okay, so that's little children. Um, next one, please. And we go from little children to children. Okay? So now we're developing a bit more. Let's look at that. Be ye therefore follow. Let's read it together. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So one of the biggest signs of maturity in any Christian is not that they can cast out devils, raise the dead, have faith to move mountains. In fact, Paul said, I might have the gift of faith that I can move a mountain. I might have the tongues of angels. I might have the, have, the, have the faith or give my body to be burned as a sacrifice to God. But he says, if I don't have love, I've got nothing. So one of the greatest uh, um, evidences of maturity as a, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, is love. Is love. The little children, be their followers of God, as little children, walk in love. Love, and so as we go from baby to toddler, then we begin to, because we're fallen in love with the one who loved us, and His love begins to flow into us, and His love begins to flow through us. Aroha kete atua, aroha kete tangata. It that is a natural process most of the time, but we have to work at it, because there will be people that God will send on purpose that are not lovely people, <laughs> that are not lovable people, should I say, to you or to me. They might get up your nose. They might oppose who you are. They might hate your, your God. They might hate Christianity and <clears throat> might have had a bad experience with God or Christians or church in the past. And so they've locked that into their brain. So whenever they see a Christian or a church, it just triggers off that all that marmite. <clears throat> all you Christians are the same. And you've got to learn to understand that's the way it is. <clears throat> but God's love can still flow through. And you don't have to agree with them, but you can just, yep, okay, keep the point. It's all good. <laughs> That's love. Instead of reacting with anger and resentment and back in your face, it's like Jesus does to us. You did that to me too. You, you didn't like me one day, remember, but I just kept loving you. So loving people when you don't feel like loving them is a great evidence of, hey, Jesus is forming in you. It's no longer you living anymore. There's Jesus coming out of you. Have you ever been surprised by that yourself? Said, Gee, that wasn't me. Who was that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you went through a situation, a trial or a test, and you're amazed that you came through the other side and, 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 you, and you made it. You, you didn't nut off. You didn't have a hissy fit. That's God. That's Jesus in you. So you're growing up. You're growing up to another level. Next level, please. <clears throat> Next PowerPoint, sorry. Okay, and so there's young adults. Yes, read this. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. Young men, young woman. Okay, so that's adolescent. That's beginning to experiment, beginning to question things, beginning to, to go out and to learn from experience, not just from, from theory, not just from teaching, but from practical application of God's word in their life, God's word in your life. And, and, and just finding out for yourself God's love, God's power in, in a personal way as a young person, a young man, young woman. Um, it, it's an interesting time because you can be filled with all sorts of theories and opinions at that time. But as long as your love for God is stronger than your love for yourself, and as long as you're in a supportive, loving whānau, that will help you keep you on the track. Because it's very, off, it's very easy to go off the track. When I got born again as a spiritual baby, <clears throat> the first thing I was going to do is become the second Billy Graham. 
and Smith Wigglesworth. <clears throat> and I'm going to save the world. And, uh, and so I was uh, about five years old in the Lord at the time. And I told Jess, we're going to Africa. <clears throat> and she says, what? I said, yeah, God's put in my heart. We're going to Africa. And not only that, a prophet came up and prophesied over me. He says, I see you in a dark land. And I said, that's Africa. So I told Jess, we're going to Africa. He said, I don't want to go to Africa. There's lions and monkeys. I said, it doesn't matter. It's what God wants. We're going to do what God wants. See, in the adolescent stage, you can have all sorts of ideas and thoughts and theories and opinions. You need a dad around you. You need somebody to be able to speak into you. That you, you need somebody you honor that you can listen to their opinion. And Jess says, no, really, I'm not going to Africa. I said, well, I'll go and tell my pastor. <laughs> And I told my pastor, thank God for Pastor John. He says, do you think that's God or Norm calling you to Africa? I said, oh, it's got to be God. <clears throat> he says, why does it have to be God? He said, because a prophet told me it was. Some... <laughs> he says, you're going to ask Jesus because usually Jesus trains you in your backyard before he sends you anywhere. You know, you're going to have something to export. I wasn't even a good dad. I was learning to be a, fa a good father, a good husband. And if we go to Africa, we've got no support. <laughs> so I went away and I prayed, and, and God says, no, I don't, you're not going to Africa. <laughs> it's not me calling you to Africa, son. I said, oh, okay. But that was, a, that was a defining moment of growth for me. Where I was a, is it my will or his will? <clears throat> and so as you're growing, you've got to be careful to think that when you hear from God that, you, that, that, that you've heard from God. Yeah, you know, you've got to... A thing is con confirmed by two or three witnesses. You always run it by somebody. You always look for advice. See, God can talk to you. And if it is God, that's great. Because others will confirm it. Yeah, I feel the same. It's getting advice. Because it was God saying you're going to a dark land, but not at that time. It wasn't until years later that he sent me to India. A dark land, dark people. Years, I've never been to Africa. I don't even want to go to Africa now. <laughs> But I've been to India 20 times. And, uh, and it was years later. And so, thank God I was part of a good family and I had a spiritual dad to be able to speak into me to help me grow through my teenage years. Now, Peter was like this. Peter had, he, he went from child, uh, toddler, child, uh, uh, baby, toddler, child, young adult. Peter was, he went through this growth, growth process. Let's read John 21. Read it together. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, immature, alive to self, and dead to God, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, mature, dead to self, alive to God, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. So this is Jesus speaking to Peter. <clears throat> and, and it was to signify the type of life that Peter was going to die as a martyr for serving God. Now Peter, before Jesus said this to him, Peter was full of self-ambition. Peter didn't want to die for Jesus. Peter wanted a convenient walk with God. And so one day Peter, and I love Peter because I relate so much to him. One day Jesus said to Peter, who do men say that I am? Who's, what, what, are people, who is, what are people saying about me? Who am I? And, and some of the apostles said, oh, you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. And and, and Peter, what do you think? And Peter says, you're the son of the God, of most high God. And Jesus said, Peter, flesh and blood hasn't shown you this, but my father from heaven. So Peter, you can imagine if you're Peter. Oh, yeah, I got it. I got the revelation. Hey, John, you didn't get it, eh? Hey, Elijah, not even. Hey, James. John, no, nah, he's dead. He's, got, he's the son of God. You got it, church. And then Jesus said... At the same conversation, Jesus says, well, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem and I'm going to be crucified at the hands of sinful men. And Peter goes, bah! no way, Lord, that's not going to happen to you. And next minute, Jesus turns around and says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. For one minute, he's lifted up. The next minute, he's called Satan. Because <laughs> he says, you're not on the, on, on the side of God, but the side of men. Hecker. Imagine what, so that's Peter, up and down. I really love Peter because I am, have had that many times. And then 
Jesus is about to be taken and, and crucified. He's in the garden and uh, soldiers come for him. But before they came, Peter went to Jesus and said, I'm going to, look, Lord, I know they're coming for you, but here's the thing. Wherever they take you, I'll go. If they take you to prison, I'm going with you. If they even kill you, I will let them kill me. And uh, Jesus says, Peter, before the rooster crows three times tonight, you're going to die. You're going to deny. Before the rooster crows tonight, you will deny me three times. Uh, no, 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 not me, not me. <clears throat> As Peter denied Jesus for the third time. You see, when you're going through growing up stages, sometimes you don't know what's going on. Sometimes it's like, what's happening with me? What, what's happening with me? I say I love you one minute, but the next minute I'm doing this. What's good? There's no strange thing. Peter says in the letters of Peter, when you go through fiery, fiery trials, do not think it's some strange thing is happening to you. Some, it's the fiery trials of God. He's burning you. What is he trying to do? Kill you. Kill your self-ambition. Killing Peter's self-ambition. Showing Peter what's in Peter. Peter didn't know what was in him. God knew. Jesus said. And Jesus said, Peter, though, when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. So three times Jesus, Peter denied Jesus, but three times Jesus offered Peter back. He said, do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? And then after that, he says, Peter, when you were young, you did your own thing. But when you're older, when you mature, when you're an adult, spiritually, someone else will bind you, the Holy Ghost. And he's going to take you places where you normally wouldn't go. And, and, and you're going to die for me. And Peter says, all good, Lord. All good. So he went for a place of no longer living for himself, but totally living only for Jesus. So that, that's, a, that's, that's where God wants us to grow to that place. And it's a process. It's a journey. Kapai? So, um, next PowerPoint, please. So I'm going to show you... Okay. Oh, okay. We should have shown this book. This is the adult level. Let's read it. I write unto you, fathers. Let's read it. I write unto you, fathers. Because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you know the Father. See, you see the whole, you see a range of growth there. That God's word is written for, for, for babies, for children, for toddlers, for, for teenagers, and for, it's written for us all. The word of God feeds us all. And the word of God helps us grow into maturity. And so, read the word of God, Father. So here, next one, please. So here's the first key of fast-tracking your maturity. Let's read this. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So to grow into maturity, sometimes it takes you know, experience. If we learn through life experiences... Have you ever been told when you're a kid, don't touch the hot stove? But we touch it anyway, eh? I did. No, oh, but once I touched, I never touched it again. Because you learn lessons through life and hopefully become a little bit wiser. The things you learn, you become wise not to do. Most of the time. So time and experience can, can develop wisdom in you. But it doesn't have to be time. And it, it, you can grow wise with a with choice. <clears throat> it says, when I became a man, meaning when I went from a child to becoming a man, I put away childish things. I, so he's talking about, I made a choice to stop acting like a child. I made a choice to put away my childish attitudes, to put away my childish talk, to put away my childish... Uh, mindsets. He made a choice to stop thinking like a child and he said, then I became a man. Right? I put it away. So it's a choice. So you can grow into wisdom just like that. There can be a, a foolish mis uh, choice and a wise choice. And it's what choice we choose determines whether we're, just, you know, don't learn or do learn. It's, it's a, just a choice we make. It doesn't have to take 10 years. But if, if we don't learn, he'll make us go through that test 10 over 10 years, again and again and again, until we choose the right choice. There's no failing in the kingdom of God. You just get the test over and over and over until you pass. <laughs> and so 
And so a choice to choose to have a hissy fit and react in the flesh or to, nah, I don't respond like Jesus. It's a choice. It's a choice. But it's a process. Sometimes I'm on Team Jesus. Sometimes I've jumped over onto Team Norm. Okay? It's a process. It's a process. So don't beat yourself up. If suddenly you made the wrong choice and you're tasting the consequences of it, it's, oh, no. If you're tasting the consequences, you made the wrong choices, and, and it's you know, a relationship thing, you, you've, you know, you're nutted out at somebody, just go and apologize to them. Okay, go put it right. Uh, yeah, God will forgive you, but just go put it right. And learn from that. Okay, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> okay, that's fast track number one. Wisdom is a choice. If you want to grow up fast, if you want to go from baby to, to, to child faster, make the right choices. It's number two, it carries on. Next one, please. And so key number two is um, it, it's sort of sequential with, with this key, with making the right choice. And the right choice is <clears throat> what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? So instead of nutting off or instead of going your way and following what you want to do, what you know you shouldn't be doing, instead of following what Jesus wouldn't do, follow what he would do. Just think, what would Jesus do? So there's a picture here. There was a, a guy who'd been beaten up and he was dying. And uh, these two people in the background, one is a priest. And the other one is an apprentice priest. And that fellow down there, uh, he's a mongrel mob. <laughs> He, he, he's, he's a Samaritan. And according to the priests, according to the Hebrews back then, they didn't believe the Samaritans, they, that they, were, they didn't believe God had anything to do with those guys. They looked down their noses at the Samaritans. And yet it was the Samaritan that was doing what God's people should have been doing. And Jesus pointed, I mean, here's Jesus in your face about this stuff. He says, you can be a Christian. You can be a pastor. But if you don't show love, people who are broken on the road, then you're not reflecting who I am. And what he's saying, sometimes those who don't know God express more love for people than those who say they do know God. So we don't want to be that sort of people, eh? Hey. And so what did this fellow do? He did what Jesus would do. He didn't do what the priest would do. He didn't do what the apprentice would do. He did what Jesus would do. And so that's the second fast track. If, if you want to grow faster, just figure out what, would, what do I want to do? I want to nut off. How dare they say that to me? How dare he do that? How dare she say this? How dare they? <sighs> but what would Jesus do? Okay? Figure out what he'd do. Se the third key is sequential, ties in with what would Jesus do? The, well, you don't know what Jesus would do unless you've read what Jesus would do. Okay, so get a Bible, put it, invest. I mean, you know, we buy Maccas, we buy stuff that we like, we buy stuff we don't even need, hey, goodies. Invest in a Bible with the words of Jesus in red and read the red. Why the red? I would say for a year, I mean, this was this year's uh, Vision Sunday was, uh, was, what would Jesus do? Do what Jesus would do, number two, and read, read the red. So get a Bible and read the red because these are the words of Jesus. Forget reading, you know, for a year, just read the red. Read the red, and you'll get to know what Jesus did. So when it's what would Jesus do, you know now what Jesus would do because you've read the red. It's pretty simple. So three keys. Make a choice to be wise. Make wise choices, number one. You'll fast track your maturity. <clears throat> Number two, figure out what would Jesus do and just yield to what he would do. Just do what he would do. Number three, read the red and learn to understand what Jesus would do. I give you praise. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> just let's bow our heads in prayer right now in the presence of God. I just want to give an invitation. I was praying last night for, and I was praying for this morning, and I was saying, God, there's, people in my city, our city, who are on the brink or on the threshold of giving up. I know they are. And you're close to them. And you want to rescue them. 
And I felt God say that you would be here this morning in this meeting. And this is, I'm not saying this to, you know, to, to make you whakama or anything. I'm just saying this because it's God's love for you. You know what, sitting in this room by a mistake, but God put His Spirit in you and touched you. And He wants you to know that He loves you. And He wants you to know that He will never give up on you. And people have given up on you. And plans haven't worked out the way you wanted. Dreams have been shattered and you've even tasted the bitter taste of betrayal. But Jesus says, I love you. And I've never given up on you. And the reason why you taste the bitter taste is because that's what this world is. It's bitter. It's bitter. And everything that this world gives you, it's bitter. But Jesus is like a sweet cup. He's like a sweet cup. And he says, you're thirsty, come and drink from my cup. Now Jesus, before he died, he, he drank from a cup, a, a metaphoric cup, not a real cup. But he said to the Father, Lord, do I have to drink this cup? Let it pass from me. But nevertheless, not what I want, what you will. That cup was dying on a cross and suffering, excruciating, terrible, murderous death for you and me. And Jesus didn't want to do it if he could get away with it. But he said, I'll go, I'll do it if I have to. I'll drink that bitter cup if I have to. And I want to share it with those of you here who are, this is talking to. Jesus drank the bitter cup for you so you could taste the sweet cup. And you haven't yet tasted the sweet cup of Jesus. And so I just want to uh, put it out there. Uh, you know who you are. I'm speaking to you now and you're sitting in this room. You feel like the only one here that I'm talking to. And it's not because someone told me about you. It's because God told me about you last night. And you've tasted the bitter cup and it's a terrible cup. The world will, it's, you'll always drink the bitter cup because that's what this world is. It's under the power of Satan. But there's a kingdom called the kingdom of God. It's about transferring into that kingdom. And to taste the, the sweet cup, I guess it means Jesus is going to be born again. You're going to start this journey I've been talking about from babe to adulthood. It's a hikoi. It's following Jesus. is isn't just going to church on Sunday. It's not just being a Christian on Sunday. It's following Jesus every day. And as you do, you'll begin to drink of the cup. So right now, where your head is bowed and eyes closed, uh, if, if what I'm speaking is talking to you, if your heart's beating a bit faster now, you're feeling like th uh, <coughs> heat going through your body, it's, it's just God's signs. He's touching to you. But you'll know in your heart, that's me. That's me. And... Uh, I'd love to pray for you wherever you are. If you just indicate to me, um, just lift your hand up. I'll see your hand. I want to just pray for you. If you want me to pray that cut of gear for you, that you, okay, you're sick of tasting the bitter cup, you want to take the sweet, taste the sweet cup and ask Jesus to come into your life right now. If that's you, just raise your hand right now. Tahi urua toru.